Mary Thibodeau, 1808-1881, was a remarkable woman. She was kind, intelligent, headstrong, and never once told a lie. She was also a voodoo high priestess. She lived her entire life in New Orleans, establishing a reputation from an early age as a potent healer and clairvoyant. People traveled for miles to simply visit her. Although many more sampled her legendary concoctions, by the 1870s she had simultaneously become one of the most feared and revered figures in Louisiana. In 1981, a landowner named Jacob Parrish traveled to New Orleans from Baton Rouge. Parrish was vastly wealthy and devoutly religious, but possessed a morbid fascination for the occult. He had hired a platoon of ex-soldiers from the recently concluded Civil War, and with them he marched down Bourbon Street and into Mary's store. Despite the protests of her assistants, Mary granted Parrish an audience. He had heard rumors that the great voodoo queen had discovered the secret to eternal life and demanded that she yield it to him. Never flustered, Mary corrected him. She had indeed discovered the ritual that would grant immortality, but only for a set period of time, fifty years to be exact. Once performed, the subject would rise again after his natural death, having no need for food, air, or water, immune to disease, and utterly impervious to bodily harm. After the fifty years elapsed, however, the subject would die once more, never to rise again. Frustrated by this revelation, Parrish nevertheless knew by his reputation to be an honest woman, and would not pass up the opportunity to live beyond his natural lifespan. Mary agreed to conduct the ritual for him, as long as he vowed to leave New Orleans permanently once it had been concluded. The Parrish agreed, and the ritual was performed. True to his word, Parrish returned to the Baton Rouge later that day, but not before ordering his mercenaries to murder Mary and burn the apothecary down. Louisiana folk are renowned for their superstitions, which many are buried. It was unusual, however, that dozens would later swear that they had been seeing disembodied shadows making their way up in Massey up to the parish mints that night. The following morning, the fifteen mercenaries were found with their necks snapped, as though they had been twigs. Parrish himself was discovered in his bed, wide-eyed and apparently terror-stricken. His throat toned down with such ferocity that the state coroner had to force to conclude that a bear somehow made its way into the locked door. Hints of black magic were lost on locals, however, who promptly buried the sixteen bodies in Mongolia Cemetery. Mary Thibodeau was a remarkable woman. She never told a lie. But that is not to say that she never withheld the truth. What she had not disclosed was that the resurrection would not take place until 72 hours after death. When Parrish's grave was exhumed on real occasion in 1953, puzzled excavators noted the singularity deep gouge marks found inside the coffin lid. I was in my bedroom, doing typical at-home teenager things, staying up late, digging around at the depths of the internet, and generally not paying attention to anything other than what was going on in my monitor. It was early in the morning, and everyone in my house was asleep but me. The room was nice and warm, despite of it being the dead of winter, since we had the windows replaced last week. We had been losing heat, especially in my bedroom, through some old storm windows, but the bitter cold was now kept outside. I don't remember what I was doing. I think in the terror that consumed me I must have forgotten. I heard a noise at my window, not the sound of a bug flying into it, or the shrubs against it. No, it was an odd noise, a thumping sound, something I'd never heard before. I didn't think anything of it initially, whether that was because I genuinely believed it was nothing or because I didn't want to find out what it was. I can't say. But I sat there for a moment and just listened to it. It was distinctly rhythmic. Thump, thump, thump. It had only been 15 seconds or so, 
and then it stopped. I shuddered and shrugged it off. After spending another hour or two browsing and consciously not looking toward the window, I turned off my computer, and I fell into an uneasy but uneventful sleep. This morning, the sun had been up for a few hours, and the things that go bump in the night weren't doing it, so I walked up to the window and spent a few minutes trying to replicate the sound that I heard. I tapped the window, bumped it with some soft objects, I even unlocked it. But I couldn't for the life of me figure out what made that sound. Nothing I did was even close. I figured that the event had been a fluke. And the day was normal until this evening. My dad had arrived home from work at the usual time, and decided that the house was too stuffy, so he came into my room and opened the window. Never in my life, that moment, have I genuinely wished to be deaf. My dad forgot to unlock the window trying to open it, when he pulled it up, it proceeded with the same noise I heard last night. The window only has handles on the inside. You don't know me. No one knows me. Only Master knows of my existence. But Master and I know all of you. We visit all of you, my friends, during the witching hour. I'm never there during the day. The sun's rays penetrate my shadowy soul and obliterate my flesh. My bones turn to ash, and my organs become dust. Daytime in one place is nighttime for another, though. So Master and I are always traveling, never in one place for too long. After the sun has died and the moon lives again, I come. I'll get close to you and breathe in the scent of your life. I listen to your heartbeat and breathing. Master then starts work on you, putting one finger in your forehead and whispering Latin words. You always end up squirming or screaming. Master calls them nightmares. I always want to comfort you hold you close, but I can never touch, not ever. Master tells me not to touch. I've learned not to touch. Master hurt me badly, and my skin, my scarred, sensitive skin, has paid the price. But sometimes, I can't help myself. When Master isn't looking, I strike. I brush my fingernails down your arms, trace your lips, comb your hair away from your face. But my skin kills your kind and breaks the blood vessels. It bruises your body in mysterious ways that you can never figure out. I'm sorry. I really am. I just can't help myself. I want to show you how much I love you. When Master and I are done with you, I always remember to take a souvenir. Usually something that's small and you won't notice being missing like a coin or a pen, snatch up from behind Master's desk. When Master and I are done with you, I always remember to take a souvenir. It's usually something small that you won't notice, like a coin or a pen. I snatch it up behind Master's back, but sometimes you don't have very much. When that happens, I take something else. With Master's permission, of course. Hair, nails, eyelashes, a part of you and it will always be mine. I hope to see you tonight, but if you don't fall asleep, we'll have a problem. Master says I can't let you see me. If you see me, our friendship is over, and I'll have to kill you. I don't want to kill you. I don't want to see the blood seep through your bedsheets. I don't want to see your face as you scream at the sight of me. My deformed skin, my scars, my love for you maybe, deep down inside, just a little bit, I do. I am Master's child, after all. Sweet dreams, darlings. I'll be waiting for you.
My mother's blue lady sat in the bed in front of me. I looked into its eyes, and it felt as if she returned the inquiring stare, while it's maintaining her soft, enticing half-smile and beautiful, alluring gaze. My thoughts returned to my dear mother, who had recently passed away, and whose last contribution to this world was the painting of the blue lady. Something caught my eye. I returned my focus to the inheritance blue lady on the bed. Did her smile just grow ever so slightly? I bent over for closer inspection, my face directly eye-level with hers. I know not of the compulsion behind my mother's desire to paint this, nor what she was trying to express, but alas, here it is, staring me in the eye, drawing me ever closer. It was too late when I realized something was wrong. I pulled my face away from the painting just as her eyes sharpened and grew stern. It was impossible, however. Where I expected to see my own room, I saw her face, only her face, nothing but her face. No matter which direction I pointed my eyes at, and even though I still felt the physical world around me, my senses dulled and grew fainter and fainter. While my fear mounted to a level I'd never seen it reach before, I felt myself fall backwards, and eventually the blue lady faded into blackness. There was never a definitive moment of awakening. Just a thrusting of my awareness into a large room, filled with chairs all facing one way, facing towards a large white wall. On the chair fourth from the right at the first row of chairs sat a woman with a posture I was familiar with. I rushed towards her, running around the chairs and stood before my mother, where she sat black-eyed and vacant, staring at the white wall. Mom? My mind formed the words, and my mouth and tongue didn't move and no sound formed. She seemed to hear me anyway. Her emotionless expression directed its gaze at me, and told me to leave. I asked her how. The color flourished to her cheeks, and her gaze gained the sense of awareness. She continued staring at me briefly, before her eyes tightened and her tears welled up. I don't know how I did it, but I did it. She took my life. Now it seems like she's taken yours. At that instant, the last words escaped her lips. She vanished, and the room gained a blue hue to it. I turned around to find the white wall had been replaced with the blue lady. She was smiling from cheek to cheek. I stared at her for a few moments, then I realized she was pulling me in. I broke the gaze and turned to rush back for the room, or the exit I hoped to find, but it was nowhere to be found. I screamed to silence as I desperately searched, but to no avail. I turned to look at the blue lady. She had enveloped the first row of chairs. She was now coming for me. I grabbed the closest chair and flung it at her face. It exploded into what I can only describe as anger. As the room changed from blue to red, the lady's face contorted into an incomprehensible rage. The wall moved fast towards me. Her eyes was now black with rage. The silent screams did nothing as she developed my full vision and my silent screams did nothing as she enveloped my full vision. And she was all I could see. The blue lady screamed and laughed maniacally. What seemed like thousands upon thousands of suffering dead people begging for contrition and the screeching and torment repeating of itself. And I lost all sense of myself in the physical world. There was only her, and ever only her. I wished for death at that moment. And while the visual upsetly of her mutilated voice contorted ever more with rage, I heard the most beautiful, soft, chilling voice. It would be the only time I would ever hear her speak. You are dead already. Your soul is mine. Where did it come from? It was painted by one DJ Duke just four years ago, as the initial down the bottom right would suggest. And it comes as a donation from the family Duke itself. Duke? As in the same family with all of those deaths? Yes, the very same. 
The reason of its display in our museum is its connection with said deaths. As it would seem that starting with the original artist's deaths, each family member which inherited the piece was mysteriously found dead at one time or another, and of unexplained causes after obtaining it. But surely that in itself doesn't make it for being so significant to be shown in the museum, does it? You would be correct, sir, if that were all there was to it. But what really gives significance to the piece is that in all 21 of the recent cases of death in the Duke family, it was found in the immediate vicinity of the corpse, giving it the chilling but absurd reputation of having actually caused the deaths. Nevertheless, the urban legend of this painting is what gives it its value. The man nodded in understanding as the tour guide suggested that the group move on. As the others walked past, he stood for a moment staring at the blue lady. He could not help but notice something sinister in her soft, enticing half-smile and beautiful, alluring gaze. After a moment, he turned to join the group, but as he took a step, he stopped and did a double take. He looked back at the blue lady, and he could have sworn that her smile had grown ever so slightly. In rural southern Illinois, a toy company began selling realistic baby dolls to expectant mothers. But apparently, after the mother had their child, the toy baby would start crying. Eventually, the rocking motion advertised to calm it down wouldn't work, and you couldn't get it to stop without shaking it. Eventually, when it started crying to the parent, they would have to beat it, and the beatings and thrashings would have to get harder and harder just to get it to be quiet. The only thing that seemed to shut the baby doll up permanently was to bash its head against the wall and destroy whatever mechanism triggered the crying. On one and more occasion, though, neighbors called the authorities to report child abuse, and when the police arrived, they found the bloody remains of infants smeared across the walls and the floor. In most cases, the mother couldn't understand why the police were there. She just got rid of the stupid doll as she rocked a baby-shaped bundle in her arms. It must have been the most run-down, filth-ridden motel room I had ever seen. The kind of place where cockroaches didn't feel the need to scatter at the flash of a light bulb. I wouldn't be surprised if a whole civilization of the nasty things were living between the walls, laying their repulsive egg sacs wherever they please, and multiplying faster than an Asian kid on Adderall. I was seated at the edge of the bed, shifting uncomfortably atop its warped mattress while trying to ignore the rank funk radiating from a pile of unwashed sheets bundled up in the corner. It was the type of room people did everything but sleep in. It was fine by me. I didn't come there for shut-eye anyways. In my left hand was a half-drunk bottle of Jack Daniels. In my right was a 32 Smith and Wesson. The extraordinarily depressing location was poetically fitting in a way. I was extraordinarily depressed after all. It was my wife who was the cause of my misery. She had broken my heart, leaving me with nothing but a vacant, grief-stricken soul, like a teenager who listened to Fall Out Boy and writes poetry on Tumblr. For a while, Suspicions of infidelity had loomed over our marriage, but I had always chalked up my conjectures as nothing more than paranoid delusions. They say denial is the best remedy for heartache. It wasn't until I stumbled across a series of implicitly sexual emails between her and the pastor of our church, a married man in his own right, 
that I was faced with the morbid reality of my wife's secret sexcapades. Pastor Alonzo was a slick, fast-talking, cutthroat shark who dressed more like a U.S. senator than a man of the claw. He pulled in a far bigger salary than one might expect a holy man to earn. A lot of people who would be surprised to find out just how profitable the preaching business can be, especially when you head up to the second biggest megachurch in California. Alonzo had a taste for life's opulent luxuries and wasn't afraid to flaunt it. It wasn't uncommon for him to drive a Mercedes-Benz to church or show off his collection of Rolex watches during Sunday services. I guess that's why my wife gravitated towards him. She always did have a weak spot for material things. There was one thing that all the pastor's money couldn't buy him though. Kids of his own. His wife Darcy's on-again, off-again battle with the big C had thrown a monkey wrench into his plans to start a family. Recently, her cancer had taken a turn for the worse, and while she lied up in the hospital on her deathbed, the pastor and my wife were getting together for some extra Bible study lessons. When I confronted my wife about the emails, things got ugly. Names were called, expletives were hurled, and threats were thrown out, by her mostly. She explained to me that the pastor invited her and the kids to move in with them once Darcy passed, an offer my better half had accepted. She said she was going to give him the family he always wanted, my family. I didn't have the money to fight a long, drawn-out custody battle or hire big-time lawyers, but Pastor Alonzo did. Couple that with the fact women usually win these kinds of disputes, even if they don't always deserve it. And you can see why things were looking so bleak for me. Another man had stolen my wife, my children, my life, and there was nothing I could do about it. The room started slowly spinning, and I realized my good friend Jack was up to his old tricks again. Nausea was beginning to set in, and I didn't want to spend my last moments alive vomiting the Carl's Jr. cheeseburger I had wolfed down an hour earlier, so I decided to stop stalling and finish what I came there for. I placed the revolver's barrel in my mouth and rested my finger on the trigger. In case you were wondering if my life flashed before my eyes, allow me to be perfectly blunt. It didn't. I was thankful for it too. I'd rather have taken a bubble bath with Bruce Valanche and Ron Howard's little brother than relive all the agony that woman put me through. I shut my eyes as tight as possible in preparation for the bullet to pass through my brain. They say, he who hesitates is lost. In short, the proverb means that spending too much time deliberating on an important decision can ultimately lead to disastrous consequences, although in my case, one tiny minute moment of pause may have actually prevented said consequences and saved my life. The cold metallic taste of the revolver's barrel on my tongue caused me to question my actions for only the briefest of seconds, but sometimes even that could be more than enough to change a man's fortunes. As I sat there, trying to talk myself into pulling the trigger, the telephone in my motel room began to ring. I slid the gun out of my mouth, sat good old Jack, the only friend I had left, down on the nightstand, and answered the phone. Hello? I said in my best possible, not about to kill myself voice. Jacob, I'm so glad you picked up. I had no idea who the voice on the other line belonged to. I never heard it before, but whoever it was, they seemed to know me. Listen, uh, Jake, before you redecorate the walls with the inside of your skull, we need to have a talk first. I hadn't told anyone where I planned on being that evening, but this guy not only knew my name and location, but even the fact that I was contemplating punching my ticket to that big toga party in the sky. Had he been watching me? 
I needed some answers. Using every working brain cell in my head, I came up with the most rational, thought-out, intelligent question I could construct. Uh... what? You said we need to have a talk, Jacob. Now sit tight. I'm on my way over to your room right now. And with that, he hung up the phone. I stared blankly at the wall, completely dumbfounded, my mind still trying to process what happened. I wondered for a moment if I had just been the victim of a prank call. It seemed from our short conversation that the guy on the other end of the line had been watching me. My first inclination was that he might have been some sort of pervert. After all, the motel wasn't exactly a four-star accommodation and I did notice that the place looked to be a magnet for weirdos, freaks, and other types of seedy characters when I checked in. I took a swig of liquid courage. For some reason, I always felt braver when Jack was around. The knock on the door nearly caused me to lose control of my bowels. The double western bacon cheeseburger was coming out one way or the other. I tried to convince myself that I was just being neurotic, but something about the call made me feel uneasy. I had become aware of a dark, inexplicable feeling that began bubbling from within the pit of my stomach the moment the phone first rang. An awful combination of dread, fear, hate, and a myriad of other terrible emotions all simmering together in some kind of unspeakable brew. Who is it? I called out. No one answered. I waited for a response and then tried again, this time with a little more bass in my voice. Who is it? I stood up from the bed, tucked the gun into the waistband of my pants and zipped up my jacket, making sure it was properly concealed before making my way towards the door. I said, who is it? Housekeeping. The voice on the other side of the door sounded like it belonged to an elderly Hispanic woman. Oh. I chuckled at myself for letting a maid get me so riled up. Please come back later. Thank you. Housekeeping. I said come back, please. I clean now? By this point, the woman was seriously trying my patience. Either she didn't speak English or she was a complete moron. There's a sign on the doorknob, can't you read? I swung open the door, ready to give the woman a piece of my wine. It says, do not dist... There was no one in the hallway. I leaned my head out of the room to see if the irritating maid wasn't bothering some other poor sap. But the corridor was as empty and barren as a blockbuster video store. Convinced that I had officially lost my marbles, I retreated back inside and closed the door behind me. Knock, knock. Not a second later, the knocking started up again. I clean now? Go away! I shouted at the top of my lungs. Where did she come from? Just moments earlier, I was alone in the halls. Listen. Please just leave me alone, I begged. There's no way in hell I'm letting you in. It was just getting harder and harder to ignore that strange dark sensation that was still brewing inside my stomach. I said go away! Once more, I opened the door. And once more, there was not a cleaning woman in sight. This time, however, I was not alone. Doubled over in laughter before me was a teenage boy, no older than 16. He was wearing a forest green hoodie and a matching flat billed baseball cap tilted off to the side, a fashion choice that made him look spectacularly douchey. His baggy jeans sagged halfway down his ass, exposing a pair of striped boxers and accenting his douchiness even further. A black bandana hung out of the back of his pocket, as if he was some kind of gangbanger. 
I found this to be particularly stupid, since he appeared to be some type of suburban white kid whose mom drove him to soccer practice in a minivan. Can I help you? I said. I was about ten seconds away from wringing the little twerp's neck. By the way, he was convulsing in laughter. It was clear that he was the mastermind behind my harassment. Oh, oh, oh man. <laughs> you should have seen yourself. You look like you just got caught with your dick in the family goat. What? The boy wiped a tear from his eye and took a deep exhale in an attempt to rein in his laughter. Damn, did you get that? Oh, sorry, now that it's whatever year, the expression is a little before your time. It's, uh, it originated in Scotland back in the 1700s. A lot more people owned goats back then, so I guess it used to be funnier. When you've been around as long as I have, it's hard to keep up with the latest lingo. Uh, what do the kids do these days, Jake? Is YOLO still a thing? You know what? Never mind. I came here to talk to you about something else. Uh, may I come in? No, you may not. I extended my arm across the door frame to block the entrance of my room. Why don't you just get the hell out of here, kid? I'm busy. Oh yes, I can see that, but uh, I'll only take a minute of your time. The boy ducked under my arm, scrambling past me before I could stop him. Once inside, he paused for a moment, surveying the room, and smiling snidely to himself. Jeez, Jake, this place is a dump. Why in the blazes would you blow your brains out here? I personally would have chosen the Ritz-Carlton uptown if I was going to kill myself. Oh, but not before ordering some of those delicious sweet potato truffle fries from the bar in the lobby. Oh, it's so good. You got about three seconds to get the hell out of here, kid. Oh, I'm shaking in my boots. Honestly, man, intimidation really isn't your forte. I promise I'll leave in a second, but as I said before, I just want to have a little bit of a chat first. What do you want? To help you out. You can help me by getting the hell out of my room. Bit snippy, aren't we? Jacob, I know you've had a rough day, but it doesn't have to end the way you think it does. So what if your wife hurt you? Buck up! There is a way to remedy this situation. It was then that I realized the darkness inside me had never gone away. Instead, it had been flourishing, spreading from my core as if pervaded throughout the rest of my body. How did this kid know so much about me? For a second time that evening, I was so rattled I could hardly spit out a sentence. Who are you? I said. He leaned in and cupped his ear like an old man whose hearing had waned over time. Were you watch? Was I w w watching you? Is that what you were going to say? Learn to enunciate. Sorry to interrupt, but if I let you do all the talking, we're going to be here all night, and believe me when I tell you, I've got other places to be. Now then, why don't I answer your second question first? Yes, I was w w watching you. But not in the creepy staring out of the window kind of way. You know, like uh, Ryan Gosling in Drive. Did you ever see that movie? Oh, surprisingly good. And that Gosling, he's got chops, I'll tell you. The guy is so damn handsome, too. Some lucky bastards just hit the jackpot in the genetic lottery, am I right? The kid was giving me a bad vibe. I slid my hand into my jacket pocket and felt through the fabric for the handle of my revolver. All the while, it continued to blabber senselessly about how the Mickey Mouse Club was the greatest thing to ever happen to the entertainment industry. I needed to somehow get control of this situation. Shut the hell up, kid. You better give me some straight answers right now. Why were you watching me? The boy's smile quickly disappeared. He scanned me up and down, probing me with his eyes as if he was examining every inch of my body, a look of utter disgust in his face. It was bizarre. His very stare made me feel ashamed and violated. More questions, huh? First off, you should probably make sure that the hammer isn't cocked on that little squeezer of yours. You're going to shoot your dick off. And then you'll really have a reason to kill yourself. Somehow, he knew about the gun I was hiding under my coat. 
I unzipped my jacket and pulled it out from my pants. He was right. I had left it cocked. I was watching you because I saw a doomed soul, a lost spirit, so to speak, who was about to let the bad guys win, and I just couldn't bring myself to allow you to do it. He moseyed over to the television and dragged his fingers down the screen, leaving a spotless streak across the otherwise dust-covered glass. Take it from a guy who's been there before. I know exactly how you're feeling right now. I too have been betrayed by someone I loved. Cast down. Thrown out in favor for another. He paused for a moment, looking at the dust that had collected on his fingertip when he wiped it across the screen. But I haven't answered your first inquiry yet, have I? Who am I? Well, that's a sort of a loaded question. I'm a man of many names. Over the years, I've been known as the bearer of light, son of perdition, even the proud one. In a story he once wrote, Washington Irving referred to me as Old Nick. I've been anointed a prince, while at the same time branded a beast. You're telling me that you're... But that's impossible. Why? You go to church, don't you? Is it hard to believe that the asinine little book that one of you people so arrogantly proclaim is the God's true word actually got something right? Don't go patting yourself on the back over being a Christian, though. The Bible's filled with more half-truths and garbage than a supermarket tap horn. I was completely taken aback by what the boy was saying. A couple minutes earlier, I was getting ready to lodge a bullet in my brain. Now I was talking to a teenager who just declared himself to be the embodiment of evil. If you're the devil, I asked, and why do you look like a kid? Why not? I do what I please. I can appear as whatever or whoever I want. You think this is weird? Once I made myself look like a snake so I could talk to a hot naked chick. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Neither did Carlos Mencia's comedy career, but it happened anyways. By the way, I assure you I had nothing to do with that. He shook his head. I suppose it's proof you require a... Uh... I miss the old days where you people would blindly take me for my word. It was so much easier to cheat at poker. The boy gave me a mischievous wink. Alright, why don't you pick up the phone? There's someone who needs to speak with you. Not a second later... A shrill, ear-splitting sound cut through the motel room. The telephone on the end table was ringing. I shot a skeptical look over to the teenager. He was holding his hand to his ear, as if there was an invisible phone in it. Hello? I said as I picked up the phone. Housekeeping. I clean now? As the boy's lips moved, I could hear the cleaning woman's voice over the telephone. He burst into a fit of laughter. I was floored. I tried to play it cool, but I'm certain he could read the shock on my face. After he had his laugh, his voice returned to normal. Not bad, right? I mean, I'm no Danny Gans, but I bet I could still play the nugget. And when he said that, he smiled but it was just a little too wide. Wider than a mouth should stretch. Ever so briefly, I caught a glimpse of his teeth. It was as if hundreds of little tiny daggers were protruding from his gums. He shifted his head ever so slightly, and his peculiar facial features had disappeared. Once again, he looked like a typical douchebag teenager. You can't have my soul, I said. It's not for sale. The boy scoffed. Oh, come on now. Do you really think I just go around buying people's souls from them? Ye have little faith in humanity, Jacob. Most people are too smart to fall for such a thing. What's a lifetime of happiness compared to an eternity in hell? Then, why are you here? Like I said before, I do as I please. And it would please me very much to do a favor for you. No contracts or souls involved. What kind of favor? I asked. He turned and started out the door. 
Why don't you accompany for a walk and I'll explain. Oh, and uh, bring that pistol with you. As the boy exited my room, I picked up the phone again and held it to my ear. I didn't hear a dial tone, so I followed the cord only to find that it wasn't even plugged in to the wall. Jack was still sitting on the nightstand, waiting to provide consultation for me if I needed it. He was going to have to wait just a little longer. I followed the boy out the door. I caught up to him halfway down the hall, and together we headed down the rusty metal stairs that leaded to the parking lot. I see that you're in a bit of a bind, Jacob. Your wife of 15 years is leaving you for an idiot pastor and taking the kitties with her. What were their names again? Ah, yes, Hunter and Elizabeth. Such darling children. Leave my kids alone. The mere thought of him mentioning my kids sent my anger into a tailspin. He stopped halfway down the stairs and jabbed a bony finger into my chest. Listen here, tough guy. Just because I look like the lost member of the Backstreet Boys doesn't mean I won't turn into some ten-foot Lovecraftian monstrosity that will bite your legs off if you continue to disrespect me. Capiche? I nodded my head. Good. I don't know what all the fuss is about anyways. I love children, and I'd love to have my own. But it's so hard to find a suitable candidate to bear the Antichrist. There's something about heralding a millennium of hell on earth and bringing about the apocalypse. And that turns most women off. The only people who ever that volunteer for the job are nut and balls wackos. And trust me, Jake, I don't want no baby mama drama any more than you do. I think he was making a joke because he paused for a second and glanced over to me as if he was expecting to hear laughs. He continued talking once he realized I didn't find him amusing. If you ask me, you have three options. Option number one, you go back to your room and blow your brains out. You never see your kids again, and your wife continues fucking the pastor. Option number two, you don't do anything like a pussy. You go back to your boring, lonely existence. You'll never see your kids on the second Saturday of every month. And your wife continues fucking the pastor. I suppose this is where you tell me about option three. When we made it to the base of the stairs... He gestured towards the parking lot, indicating the direction he wanted to walk. Smart man. Option number three is this. You take that 32 caliber Smith & Wesson over to your pastor's McMansion tonight. Your wife's there now, discussing church business. I'm sure he's got her down on her knees, taking a communion as we speak. You know, accepting the holy body inside her mouth and all that. Okay, okay, I get it. It's a terrible joke. We aren't even Catholic. What are you trying to say? You want me to kill Pastor Alonzo? Yeah, exactly. Kill the pastor, kill your wife. Hell, kill his annoying little shih tzu while you're at it. You have to kill them, Jacob. Don't let them take your children from you. End their lives for trying to ruin yours. I'd do it for you. But no killing is one of the few rules I'm bound to in my miserable plane of existence. I have to admit, it was an idea that had crossed my mind earlier that night. More of a fantasy than anything. I never actually considered going through with it. But that would be a sin, I said. Now that I know hell exists, there's no way I'd do anything to risk damnation. Look at who you're talking to, Jacob. Don't you think I have a little bit of pull down there? For this particular night, I will absolve you of your sins. Think of it as a get-out-of-jail-free card. And don't worry about the fuzz either. I have friends in high places. You won't even be considered a person in interest in the investigation. I couldn't believe I was even entertaining the idea. I had become so engrossed in what the miniature Kevin Federlin was proposing that I didn't even realize he was leading us to my car until we were standing right in front of it. So... If it's not my soul you want, what are you getting out of this? Ah, I see my reputation precedes me. Uh, like I said before, I'm just doing you a solid. He stuck his fist out waiting for me to bump it. I left the devil hanging. Maybe one day in the future, 
you will pay me for my favor. Or not. You certainly wouldn't be obligated to. What kind of favor? I don't know. Pick up my dry cleaning? I haven't thought of it yet. Who cares? I may not even bother you ever again after this night. I reminisce back to when my wife and I were young. We were so in love. And now I was standing in a parking lot under the neon lights of the world's dirtiest roach motel, letting the baby-faced demon talk me into murdering her. How did it come to this? She's my wife, I said. Part of me still loves her. I don't know if I could do anything that would harm the mother of my children. Oh, and clearly she loves you too. Why else would she be on her back, letting her idiot pastor plow her into next week? And when he said that, his voice got deeper, a thousand octaves lower than anything I've ever heard in my life. The sound was maddening. It made me want to bury my fingers into my ear canals until my eardrums burst. Your adulterous, horrible wife sins with that slimy, two-faced, sorry excuse for a human being as we speak. If that wasn't enough, she plans on ruining you by taking your children. And for what? Because you don't have a big house or a fancy car? She used you until something better came along, and he did the same thing to his wife. Hell is full of men and women like them. Send them where they belong. It felt as though his voice was microwaving my brain from the inside. I grabbed my head and fell to my knees. That pastor sins in God's, in God's name, name, and you'd really sit there and do nothing? Send them to hell, Jacob. Send them to the place where they'll burn for all of time. Okay, I'll do it. Excellent. His voice had conveniently reverted back to normal. Let's get started, shall we? I'll meet you at the pastor's house. I'd ride with you, but I'm the lord of fucking darkness. I don't drive a Prius, <laughs> you know? Even though he wasn't in the car with me while I drove over to Pastor Alonzo's home, I knew that I was far from alone. Every time I doubted my sanity, every time I started to question if what had transpired was even real, he was there, standing on a street corner, waiting at a bus stop, even watching me from the windows of other cars as they passed me by. I realized now that he was keeping an eye on me, making sure I didn't get cold feet. It came as no surprise to find him already waiting for me on the front steps of the pastor's massive home when I pulled up. He placed a hand on my shoulder when I got near and spoke some final words of encouragement to motivate me. Do it for your children, Jacob. From the moment I nudged open the pastor's gaudy, oversized front door, I could hear he and my wife wailing away from the bedroom upstairs. I drew my gun and followed the moans up the steps. Jeez, Jake, sounds like a couple of pigs getting slaughtered in there. Is that what it sounds like when you guys bump uglies? I brushed off his inconsiderate quip and leaned against the door. The boy was licking his lips in anticipation. It seemed as if he wanted them dead worse than I did. Doubt began to seep into my mind. I was no killer. The very thought of murdering the mother of my children was beginning to make me feel sick. Perhaps sensing apprehension, he started whispering in my ear. Do it, Jake. Send them to hell. His words were easy to ignore. I was too busy thinking about my kids. Could I really take their mother away from them? Even though I had let the boy manipulate me that evening, I still had my free will. I knew that I had the power to walk out the front door if I wanted to. No one needed to die. He who hesitates is lost, Jake. How could I even pull the trigger? For God's sakes, I still love the woman. That's when that dark, inexplicable feeling that had been growing inside me started to dwindle. In its place, I felt hope. 
hope that maybe if I could talk to her, even hear her speak, I would come to my senses. Then, almost on cue, her voice rang out, resonating through the air like a magnificent melody plucked from the fingers of a master harpist. Fuck me, preacher man. I kicked in the door. My gun had six bullets. It only took me three. It would have been two, but I couldn't resist the opportunity to relieve the pastor of his holy scepter. It's strange how dreaming murder can be. All I did was point my gun and pull a trigger. Yet my body felt like I had just ran a marathon. I knew you had it in you, Jacob. But holy hell, I didn't expect you blast off his pecker too. It wasn't his wisecrack that startled me. His voice had changed. It was deeper than a teenager's now. More dignified too. Perhaps most alarming. It was a voice I knew all very well. When I heard echo up the stained glass windows of my church every Sunday for years. Pastor Alonzo's voice. I whirled around to see the man I just shot smiling at me from the doorway. Relax, he said as he entered the room. Relax. It's just me, Lucifer, king of the underworld, father of the lies, yada yada yada. I looked back at the bed. The real pastor's bullet-riddled body still lied motionless next to my wife's corpse. Their cadavers intertwined within a set of tacky blood-stained bedsheets. What? Well, why did you make yourself look like Pastor Alonzo? I asked. Why does it matter? I do as I please. Before I had a chance at a follow-up question, the thunderous sound of the pastor's front door being slammed shut carried through the house and up to the bedroom. My heart began to race as a bevy of heavy footsteps made their way up the stairs. What the hell's going on? I demanded, but he didn't answer. The wicked grin painted across his face sent a wave of fright through my body. Do you know what they're going to do to you in prison, Jacob? He said. Two uniformed police officers strode into the room. As the policemen made their way towards me, my panic began to intensify. All I could think about was wasting the rest of my life away in an orange jumpsuit and playing housewife at the behest of my cellmate, a tattooed skinhead named Knifeface. I still had three bullets left, and I knew there was only one way out of the situation. I raised the revolver to my temple as the cops marched towards me. I don't know if I really would have pulled the trigger if they attempted to arrest me. Thankfully, I didn't get the chance to find out, because instead of drawing their guns on me, they brushed right by without saying a word. I watched in awe as they started wrapping the pastor and my wife's bodies in the soiled silk sheets. To my surprise, they appeared to be cleaning up my mess. You know who fell to the floor and began howling? Ha! Now you really look like you got caught with your dick in the family goat. I'm just joshing you, Jake. These fine gentlemen are with me. Them too. He motioned over to the doorway. Two more men I hadn't noticed before wearing plain clothes, but still brandishing badges were waiting in the doorway. Jerry, come over here a second. The older, heavy-set man sauntered towards us. His somber face and reluctant gait made him look like a kid who was just caught with his hand in the cookie jar. The no longer baby-faced demon patted him on the back. Do you know who this man is, Jacob? I shook my head. Cherry here is the head of the police department. That means he's very important. Pleased to meet you, I said. I really wasn't. At that point, all I wanted to do was distance myself as far away from the pastor's house as possible and forget the whole night ever happened. 
The police chief remained silent. The shame and discomfort in his eyes told me the feeling was mutual. The demon gestured over to the other man still standing at the door. Once again, he focused his attention on me. Guess who's going to be heading your wife's murder case? What about the pastor? I asked. Who's going to be looking into his murder? He stretched his arms and twirled around as if he was showing off a brand new coat. What are you talking about? Pastor Alonso wasn't murdered. He and his wife just decided to move away so they could do missionary work in Africa. See? Everything wraps up neat and tidy and you get off scot-free. Now Jacob, before you leave tonight, I wanted to speak to you about that favor. What? You know, we talked about this. I said that maybe someday I might ask you to return the favor I did for you. Yeah, I said. I remember. I guess I didn't expect it to come so soon. Well, life's funny like that sometimes. Don't worry, though. It's nothing you can't do in your sleep. I'm not asking you to pick up and dispose of some dead bodies like these guys. What do you want? He leaned in close and looked at me with a solemn expression on his face. Listen to me, Jacob, because this is the only favor I will ever ask of you. It is imperative that you attempt to contact Darcy Alonso. You understand? What? His request had left me puzzled for numerous reasons. But Darcy Alonso has cancer. She's dying. His lips curled into a devilish smirk. Well, let's just say I did her a little favor. I waved my finger in his face. But you said I'm not obligated to listen to you, right? If I wanted to, I could go over to the hospital right now and tell her about everything that happened tonight. Of course you can, Jacob. Like I said, there's no binding agreement between us. Your soul is free to do what it wants. As a matter of fact, I stake no claim to any of these man's souls. They're just people who were kind enough to repay the favor I did for them. I've done favors for a lot of people, Jacob. Cops, judges, lawyers, even pedophiles who take pleasure in the rape and murder of children. Hey, that reminds me, don't your kitties walk home from school every day? And when he said that, he looked me right in the eye. It was as if his stare caused my mind to play out a thousand different scenarios, each one more heinous and vile than the last. It was like looking through a window into hell. Darcy and I are going away. All you have to do is forget about her. Forget about this entire night if you want. But don't forget I'm always watching you, Jacob. He didn't need to say another word. The message was clear. I turned and exited the pastor's house without looking back. The next few hours were a blur to me. I remember driving back to my home, vomiting in the kitchen sink. That double western bacon cheeseburger finally did make its escape, and passing out on the couch in my living room. My wife's body was found 48 hours after I shot her inside of a liquor store dumpster. Just as he said, I was never even considered a suspect. Her murder was pinned on a 19-year-old kid from the barrio. It took no more than a week for the jury to reach a guilty verdict. He was sentenced to death. The kid is currently incarcerated and trying to appeal the jury's decision. But something tells me he won't have any luck. I have a feeling that I'm not the only person who has a favor to repay. Darcy Alonzo checked out of the hospital that evening and was gone by morning. Word around the church was that she and the pastor had believed her miraculous recovery to be a sign from God, so they set out across the globe to spread his message. But if you ask me, that story is a bigger load of bullshit than a politician making a campaign speech while rolling in a pile of fertilizer. Two weeks after they left town, their house was put up for sale. 
It was hard for my children to lose their mother at such a young age. But they'll learn to get along without her. I like to think I've been doing a hell of a job as a single parent, cooking, cleaning, and taking care of them. It took a while for things to start to get back to normal for us, but the fact that they're smiling and laughing again makes me think that they're going to be okay. About a year after everything happened, I received a green envelope in the mail. I didn't think much of it at first. It was the middle of December, and I had already collected dozens of Christmas cards. It wasn't until I tore open the envelope that I realized that dark, inexplicable sensation had made its presence known once again in the pit of my stomach. It wasn't the title on the front of the card that made me feel sick. Merry Christmas from the Alonzos. It was what I saw when I opened it. The message was just one sentence long, but it hit me in the gut like a body blow from Mike Tyson. The doctor says we're due to have the best Christmas ever. Attached to the card was a picture of Darcy and the pastor wearing ugly Christmas sweaters and grinning from ear to ear. Darcy's sweater, however, was pulled up past her midsection, exposing her belly. She looked to be about nine months pregnant. May 26th. It hasn't rained in three months. The whole town's worried. We need rain in a little rural town like this. The crops. The reservoir. June 7th. Marlene cries at night. The girls are worried too. I started going to church. June 16th. No rain. Attending church almost every day. God will save us. June 28th. Please, God, let it rain. July 1st. No rain. July 4th. We couldn't light off fireworks. Everything's too dry. I got out a Latin Bible and read from it. No rain. July 24th. No rain. Four months now. Are we cursed? August 6th. No rain. I've given up on prayer. Other gods exist, do they not? The heath and devils are tricky, but maybe they can help us. August 18th. Rain dance all night. No rain. I need stronger magic. August 25th. Kill the calf. Called for rain. Storm clouds on the horizon gone by the evening without rain. September 3rd. Rain! Sweet rain. It worked. No price is too high for survival. September 7th. The funeral was nice. Little afar. 
September 18th. One day of rain isn't enough. September 21st. Rain. I was shaking all night after. September 27th. Rain. God forgive me. October 1st. been killing a lot of people to maintain the weather. It rained today. People are saying that the town is cursed. I stopped going to funerals. October 9th. Marlene found out. I don't know how. Maybe there was a reason we sat aside. We strapped up and got our knives. It will rain again tomorrow. Have you ever wondered why in Generation 2, Gold, Silver, and Crystal, that there's only one place in the whole of Johto and Kanto that you can breed Pokemon? I can tell you why, but I warn you, you may not like what you hear. Especially if you feel particularly attuned to the suffering of animals in our own world. With that out of the way, I shall begin. A lot of emphasis was put on Team Rocket's little science experiment at the Lake of Rage, and soon after that their takeover of the radio tower. And all the while, they had already set up a much larger, but more secretive operation. You see, the daycare man and his wife were not the first to discover Pokemon had laid eggs. This was the first discovery of a lowly rocket grunt who was in charge of looking after a captured ditto. The rocket grunt Hiroshi, thought to be the easiest job on the whole organization, not once had he run into an 11 year old child who had single handedly defeated Team Rocket not even a year ago. He was not respected enough to have his plans follow through though. So he's never messed up so badly that he'd have to come face to face with Giovanni and explain it himself. Hiroshi had it really easy. All he had to do was make sure that the Pokemon weren't too loud, that they generally were fed, and on a rare occasion if they soiled themselves he would wipe it up with a rag. The Ditto were kept in a squaler. Hiroshi is regularly required to electrocute them if they were not silent. However, most nights they remained silent, with only a sad humming song that resonated in the filthy hallway. Each cage, no more than 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters, and electrified mesh wire held the two Dittos. The transformation pits also held two Ditto, but they were 10 by 10 feet wide to accommodate for the shape-shifting of larger Pokemon. All controlled by electrical frequencies to what all controlled by electrical frequencies as to what Pokemon they became. They all sang, one after another, and the song spread outwards. Roshi felt his eyes begin to flutter. He felt compassion for the beasts cramped in their cages or in the transformation pits. Besides the song wasn't unpleasant to listen to. But falling asleep on guard was a surefire way for things to go wrong. To help keep him awake, he reached for a Pokeball. When the energy was released from the ball, Narcanine padded towards him, towards its master. If you smell anything out of place, or if they try to escape, use whatever force you think is necessary. Narcanine nodded, and its large head padded down to sit next to his master. With that, Hiroshi nodded his head, and almost instantly fell asleep. By a terrible squealing and panting, his eyes bolted open in a panic. He scanned the hallway, the cages, and the transformation pits. The song had died, and its place was a horrible screeching noise, as if the ditto began to panic at once. Hiroshi had only a split second to run to the lever and flip it down before several sparking bolts seared through the wires, causing a high squeal from the confined ditto, before they knew to be silent once more. But still, the whimpering and hushed language continued between them as they shuddered in their cages. The panting continued. Hiroshi stepped slowly along the aisle, looking at each single cage. 
The ditto stared back at him with an expression of pure fear as they shook from cold and hunger. It was the first transformation pit that he found his Arcanine, panting. From under him was a transformed ditto, in the shape that Hiroshi did not recognize. It was dog-shaped, but was black with white horns, and its head and a long, whipping tail. The ditto dog panted helplessly under the Arcanine. The searing pain of a forced transformation to an unfamiliar shape confused and distressed it. Arcanine, having a long, loud yelp before demounting the ditto dog and paddling back towards Hiroshi, jumping with offensive ease. Hiroshi himself was still in shock after he watched the Pokemon shape in front of him. He had never seen anything like it before. The ditto shape looked sickly. Many of the bones were not internal, and showed the outside dog-like body. It panted again before collapsing. Hiroshi shook its head, and unsheared his Pokemon away. Such strange things were not uncommon to see in Transformation Pit Dittos, sometimes with the different currents. The Ditto chain shaped into structures that only they had seen before. Excited by what concept of a new Pokemon, Team Rocket had tried desperately to get Ditto to stabilize into one of the new forms, but no avail. What disturbed Hiroshi, however, was the way that the Arcanine had simply mounted the poor creature. In the weeks that followed, Hiroshi took care not to release any of his Pokemon out of their balls when he was on his Ditto duty. He paid extra attention to the Dark Dog Ditto, who laid sprawled out on the floor of a pit tongue lolling from its mouth, and its breathing extremely labored. Lack of food, water, and cleanliness making it look even worse than it had already. Hiroshi smirked a smile. You have the look of a doomed hound. The dog Ditto looked up and shakily stood on its four legs. What happened next astounded and scared Hiroshi for the rest of his days. The Ditto dog scrunched up his face and howled again causing the cage ditto to scream with terror. Hiroshi ran to one of the Poke Doctors, thinking it was a ditto dying. Now that would be an offense to Giovanni. When they both had returned, the ditto dog was still standing, howling inhumanely. A high-pitched squeal as its innards burst from its backside and fell into a bloody heap behind it, a large, solid mass among the awful debris. The doctor jumped onto his pen immediately but the ditto dog had already begun to dissolve. First into a pinkish gelatinous goop, ditto had expired, but still left on the dirt of the pit was an offal and the large mass. The doctor stiffed through the offal to pick up the mass. To its surprise, it was steady in his hands and held it up to Hiroshi. It was an egg. The egg was monitored for days on end by a scientist in Hiroshi who took a personal interest in the big discovery. Until all at once, the news spread about the department and the egg was hatching. There was a big commotion at the department. As the people crowded at the small table, the egg began to snake and crack, little splinters coming from the pieces, and the dark had emerged. It was disgusting. It was gruesome. It looked evil, but it was new. A puppy. Black as night with a skull seeming to be visible on its outside and its ribs protruding from its back. It was perfect. Hiroshi stepped forward, parting the crowd. His mind swimming with opportunities. If this Pokemon lived, thrived, and reproduced, then he had successfully achieved, by accident, what the scientists had been trying to do with Dittos when they were captured. He had created a new Pokemon. Its mother, Ditto, was Houndoom. And its hound? Hound hour. The scientists nodded in silent agreement, all astonished by the events that happened before them. From that moment onwards, Hiroshi was presented before Giovanni with the Hound Hour, and was promptly put in charge of the Ditto Evolution Project. For the next two years, Hiroshi studied the Ditto in the pits, forcing them into strange, grotesque shapes with the aid of electrical current, and then forcing them to breed with a male gender of a similar-looking Pokémon. He managed to do this successfully with at least a hundred different variations of Ditto. All of them managed to birth eggs. Some eggs never hatched. Some eggs hatched and the Pokemon died within a few days. Some eggs hatched and the offspring were 
and fertile are never evolved, but there were many. There were many eggs that hatched just like Houndour and managed to successfully evolve and rebreed. After this was successful, they had tried many Pokemon they already knew. Pikachu Dittos had a strange Minichu baby. Magmar Dittos had these stranger Minimar babies. The discovery was outstanding, but tragic as none of these offspring lived after the mother Ditto had expired, which led to the development of better medical care, and gradually the Ditto could sustain more than the offspring in their lifespan. But still, the babies did not thrive. This continued for many years until word of mouth began to travel, with wealthy Pokemon collectors sporting brand new types of Pokemon, the Ditto, their eggs, and their babies were all mysteriously released in one night. And Hiroshi was found dead in the labs, his body charred beyond recognition through visual means alone. Whatever this was, it was a revolt. Whether this was a revolt from the tortured Ditto, who just so happened to escape, or whether Pokemon activists managed to infiltrate and release the Pokemon themselves is unknown. It was several years afterwards when many of these species had begun to thrive in the regions of Johto and Kanto. That an old coop living outside Goldenrod came home to rather shocking discoveries. A large soft egg nestled between the two Pokemon they were looking after. Rocket continued the project, however, with whatever ditto they could find. Still to this day, they are trying to manipulate them. And with a bigger gene pool than ever before, there is no end to the mutations they can force. It was a cold night, cooler than usual for the city. The moon shone above us, lighting our path. We didn't need to see our destination. The place may have all been programmed into our minds. The only place open at the far end of the town, overlooking a placid ocean that stretched for who knows how long. It drew us like a flame. The building, decrepit and decaying as it was, let loose a soft light from its one window. A single word, its paint chipped away, stretched over the plate glass. At one point it said Jerry's, and now it just looks too disfigured to tell what it is. The place is old. Drugs were one of the many things that it offered, but only to a close crowd of hand-picked customers. Everyone else knew it as a coffee house that stayed open despite of its lack of business. Many suspected that it was a front art for something more sinister, or that it was simply being funded from the owner's pocket alone. If only they knew. They'd wish that the explanation was that simple. Still, the thoughts of the general populace aren't why you're reading this, are you? You're reading this because you're insane. <laughs> Sorry, that just kind of slipped out. What I meant was you're reading because you're seeking, like many others. I have to warn you. You're traveling a well-worn, but nonetheless dangerous path. If you want to continue, fine. Just don't blame me. You're going to need a full bottle of alcohol, preferably whiskey, though the brand doesn't matter. A knife, a mix of Destroying Angel, Halibor, and Belladonna. All of these things must be got at the same place. This is the place you'll be performing the ritual, so be sure it's lonely or you risk being caught. I know what you're thinking. How the hell am I supposed to get a bottle of whiskey, a knife, and some rare herbs all in the same place? All I can say is, there's ways. Manipulate a friend into buying these things for you and bringing them to the ordained spot. Find the herb knife alcohol store, I don't know. I just know it has to be done. When you've done this, wait for a night. When the stairs sparkle like the shards of a shattered mirror, if it's the right time, you should smell incense faintly in the wind. As soon as you arrive, the skies will darken to a royal purple and the grasses, even if not present before, will blacken. The slightest touch will make them crumble, so it's easy to know where you've been before. Look to the horizon, and you'll see two white pillars jutting up into the sky. Walk towards them, 
you'll want to make the most direct path possible. Trust me on this. It's my only gift to you. Approaching them, you'll find a woman chained to the bottom of a deep well, deeper than you could possibly hold your breath. She doesn't struggle. She doesn't scream. She simply stares up at you with a persistent want. Don't meet her gaze. Or you'll find yourself walking towards the well, whether you want to or not. You'll jump in and eventually drown trying to save her. Keep walking towards the pillars and find a series of raised platforms, forming a staircase to the highest one. As you walk up them, you'll hear and see the most terrible things. People being slowly flayed to the bone, infants being raped, people screaming for help, for mercy. Ignore them. They are but memories now. You cannot save them. As you step onto the platform, it will collapse out beneath you. Still got the alcohol from before? You're going to need it if luck's not in your favor. As you plummet to your death, you will hear one of two things. A powerful voice stating that it is not yet your time to die, or the same voice reciting a long list of everything you've ever done that would condemn you. If you hear the former, congratulations, you're clear. Skip the following message and carry on. If you hear the latter, well then, you better hope death's thirsty. If he is, you can trade your bottle of alcohol for one more year. It will be easily the most uneventful year you'll ever have, because your unplanned extension cannot be allowed to have effects on the lives of others, lest it attract the notice of the Ark Gods, who are very destroyed and start again happy. Still, this kind of thing happens when you make people serve thousand year long shifts. Just saying. If all goes properly, you'll find yourself in the vast expense of void. Stay perfectly still and watch for the ground. The ground should spawn flashing squares. These are markers for the more forgeful deities, so that they can avoid death by matter of compression. That's right, you're in the heart of a black hole. Technically, you're smaller than the lowliest bit of the subatomic particle. But that's got no bearing on things. Remember the coffee house from before? That's your end goal. As you walk through the wormhole, keep it in your mind. Feel the cool sea breeze on your face. Smell the crisp, salty air. Hear the plucking of a nostalgic melody drift idly through the night. Go towards the light and open the door. If you did it correct, you'll see an empty coffee house. Tables are scattered throughout the room, all in states of disuse. Some chairs are tipped over, the food on the table is waiting patiently for an owner who will never return. Choose one of them and sit down. Eventually the piano man will notice you and come over. He will ask you about why you're here so late at night. The smell of stale coffee and cigarette smoke will lace his every breath. But make no notice nor mention of this. Else you will be found the next morning, reeking of boar burning and coffee. Your vocal cords will be messily removed from your throat usually severing the jugular, and it would be discovered in your rectum. If you give him a decent answer, he'll suddenly lean close and inhale deeply. Don't ask him what he's doing. Just hold up your packet of herbs. He'll snatch it away, a greedy gleam in his eyes, and point his chubby thumb towards the back. Walk back there and you'll find the door to the cellar, conveniently hidden behind the register counter. Pull it and open to find a beautiful woman shackled to the tiny room's walls. As soon as you go down, the door will slam shut behind you. You'll hear the sound of a lock clicking into place. The person before you is a god or goddess that has fallen from grace. If you wish to become a deity, you must find a way to kill them and steal their soul. Do this with much quickness, chained or not. You're facing a deity. If you aren't destroyed in the first couple of seconds, You'll eventually starve to death. But you'd give anything to be powerful, wouldn't you?
I'd never been fond of anyone at my local school. They were all a little too rude and boring for me. You see, I grew up in a small area with not many people interested in art like I am. So I had to venture off from home and found myself attending a pretty rural art college. It's sort of like a normal university, except it's full of big-headed people. Now the only reason why I'm here is because I've always wanted to be an illustrator. A children's book designer of sorts. I'd always taken a keen interest in children's media and classic books, such as the Arthur series. So when I was sent to live at this college, I was taken back when I realized a lot of the other students here were not all fine artists. You know the kind. The ones who splatter paint on a canvas and claim it's art. I'm not really big on that sort of thing, but I didn't question it. I settled into the new place pretty quickly. I was sharing a dorm with a few other students. There was myself, a graphics designer named Josh, a film slash animator called Lily, and there was one more guy named Daniel. Daniel was one of those fine artists I just described to you. His room was decorated with photographs of distorted women, and he always had weird music playing too. It's like sort of trippy, happy 60s music. He also liked to smoke, so his room always smelt like an old ashtray. It was pretty gross, but he was a nice enough guy and we all got along well enough. We soon became a tightly packed group of friends. It was the start of a new term for us all, and we'd come back from home after spending the summer there. We unpacked all of our things and started talking about what we'd done over the summer. I went hiking with my stepdad. We went on one of those summer camps, replied Josh. I spent most of the time with my girlfriend. We watched films and went to watch some plays too, Lily said. She spent a lot of time whining about missing her sporty girlfriend but we were glad they got some time together. I hadn't really done much worth mentioning. I did the usual stuff. I went out to parties, went on trips with my family. Nothing really special. I was just about to pipe up and speak when I got interrupted. I spent my time at the dentist, we heard Daniel say. My father is a doctor of sorts, so he let me come with him to explore the hospital. My favorite place to visit was the dentistry. I got to touch and feel real teeth. It was cool. We all stared at him a bit confused. Were you even allowed to have random strangers go in the hospital rooms, let alone play with the equipment? We really didn't care. We knew Daniel was that sort of guy anyway. He was known for getting into trouble for the sake of art. That was always his excuse. We spent our first couple of days getting to grips with our assignments. We found all that we had to do. Naturally, I had to study some illustrators and mimic their styles. Josh spent some money on a new Mac to do some more design tests, and Lily had started playing about with claymation. It was a pretty nice vibe, when we'd be all in our dorms, talking and giving ideas. Well, at least it was until Daniel would start insulting us. He had never been the same since he came back from that summer break. He seemed more cold and distant. We assumed something must have happened to him over break, so we decided to not press him on it. He never told us anything about his projects. In fact, he never even told us what the subject was. It was pretty normal for Daniel to be reserved, but never this much. At nights, he'd just make himself some dinner and shut himself in his room, crank up the music, and not be seen until next morning. The rest of us would just go out places, like bowling or going to a local gig. Daniel used to happily tag along, but not anymore. One night, Josh and I had gone out for a long time. But Lily didn't come with us. She said she wanted to see if Daniel was okay, and since he hadn't been talking to us for a few days now, it seemed legitimate. We could see her point, and we complied. She had spent the evening knocking on his door trying to get him to speak with her. Just before we left, we saw his door open, and Lily step inside before it was locked again. Brushing it off, we head out. We'd gone to see a movie, and then we went to go get some innocent drinks. It was fun, but we didn't get home till around 2 a.m. When we got back, Josh said goodnight and went straight to bed. I ain't gone to bed yet. I was pretty damn hungry. Drinking always made me so hungry. So I raided our fridge and found some cold pizza from the night before. I was going back into my room when I realized something. Something I didn't notice before. Daniel wasn't in his room. And Lily wasn't in hers. Due to Daniel's strange new behavior of locking himself in his room until early hours, and Lily never went anywhere without texting us, this was pretty weird. I went over to the door and gave it a knock, 
and sure enough, the door just opened right up. It wasn't locked or anything. I just assumed he and her had gone out with some of his Ponzi art friends. But it wasn't like Daniel to leave the door open like this. I've always been a nosy son of a bitch, so I stepped inside to see if there was any signs he had gone somewhere. His keys were gone, his jacket was gone, but he'd left his wallet on his desk. The other thing that was odd is that he'd left his laptop on his bed and it was still on. The screen was still lit up. Curiosity got the best of me. Perhaps this could be my chance to find out what art project he'd been hiding. I mean, Daniel was a fine artist, so it could have been anything. I noticed that he had a USB plugged in and had two files on the screen. One was called Dentist Photos, and the other file was a singular image named Teeth.jpg. I clicked on the Dentist Photos file, and there was just pictures of people's teeth and plastic models of teeth. It was nothing interesting. I clicked back off and decided to click on Teeth.jpg. The image would be forever burned into my brain. It startled me so bad that I slammed the laptop shut, shaking, as I sat back. I wasn't sure if I wanted to lift the screen again, but I knew I had to, or Daniel would know someone touched his laptop. I lifted the screen again, staring at the image for a brief moment before clicking away from it nervously. I then made a decision. I needed to show this to Josh and Lily in the morning. This was seriously messed up. I mean, I know that Daniel's an artistic kind of guy, but that was just insane. I quickly bolted back to my own room and scoured for my USB drive. I eventually found it and darted back to Daniel's laptop, where I copied the image onto my USB. I stared at the image for a little while longer. I was trying to dismiss the image as a mere photo manipulation, but there was something wrong about it. Perhaps it was the black soulless eyes, or the fact that whoever or whatever the creature was, was pulling its mouth in such a weird, disturbing way. It almost looked forced, like whoever this creature was, was forced to pose this way. I shook it off as a mere thought, and fixed up the laptop so it didn't look tampered with before I went back to my own room. Soon enough I heard the front door open, then the sound of footsteps, then Daniel's door locking. Daniel was back home. But there was no signs of Lily. The next morning I had waited until Daniel got off to one of his lectures, and since it was Friday, Josh and I had the morning off. I decided now would be a good time to show Josh the image. I asked him if he wanted to see what Daniel had been hiding from us, and he confusedly but eagerly said yes. I brought my laptop into the living room and loaded up my USB. I opened the image for both of us to see. Josh's expression fell to shock before he sputtered. Oh, what is that thing? I could just tell by his reaction that we both were thinking the same thing. This couldn't have been the art project image. There's no way this would pass for a fine art piece. Would it? I mean, sure, art can be creepy at times, but I can't imagine his teachers would appreciate such a creepy and disgusting image. I know that Daniel can be a creepy son of a bitch, but that isn't right. We've got to show Lily that we both cut off one another. We paused briefly before looking at one another with confusion. Where was Lily? I realized that she hadn't come back with Daniel last night, and neither of us had seen her this morning. When I explained to Josh what I did last night, he began to worry. Lily was never the kind to just sneak off and not tell anyone. I picked up my phone and began to ring her mobile, but for a while there was silence. Then, just from Lily's room, we heard a faint buzzing sound. Josh got up and walked into Lily's room rather quickly. He'd never been one to go into girls' rooms, and came back holding Lily's phone in his hand with a worried look on his face. Lily was gone. We had to find a way to get a hold of her. Maybe she just gone to a lecture and forgot her phone, I shuddered. Josh shook his head, chewing his lip out of nerves. N no, that's not right. Lily doesn't have lectures on Friday, remember? She normally at least say hello and take her phone. We know she lives on that thing. She never stops texting her girlfriend. He was right. Lily's life revolved around her phone so we knew there would be no way she'd leave it. 
Suddenly, her phone lit up. Someone was calling her. We both looked at the phone, then back at one another, before Josh passed the phone to me. I brought it up to my ear before speaking. Hello? On the other end of the line, it was her girlfriend calling. I recognized her husky voice. Ah, Louie! You're there! Thank God you're okay. You didn't text me at all last night or this morning. I thought something was wrong. I cringed a little bit, realizing I had to break it to her that I wasn't Lily. As I spoke, I heard her girlfriend begin to get upset. I could hear her heavy breathing and sniffling. I felt so bad for her, but perhaps she could be my chance to figure out what happened to Lily. Where is Lily? She hasn't spoken to me since last night. I thought she was just playing a joke on me, but now I don't know. I looked at Josh with a confused stare as he began to pace around a bit. I put the phone on the loudspeaker and asked her, Why do you think Lily's playing a joke on you? Did she say anything odd? Yes, her girlfriend replied. She sent me a message around 1.30 a.m. I looked at Josh baffled before I asked again, What did the message say? Help me. I looked at Josh, with wide and worried eyes. Lily would never pull a prank like that on anyone, let alone on her own girlfriend. She always told us how worried she'd be about her girlfriend getting paranoid. So we knew she wouldn't send a message like that, unless she had a reason. I continued to speak with her girlfriend, but I was getting nowhere, so I reassured her that we know where Lily was, and that we'd be calling her back tonight. Her girlfriend seemed suspicious, but just agreed and put down the phone. Myself and Josh paced back and forth. We had no idea what this could mean. Why would Lily send a message like that? We continued to think for a while, and decided until we knew where Lily was, we are going to skip our lectures. We spent a long time thinking over things, and began to write down our connections that we made. Afterwards, Josh read the list out to me so we could think them over. Alright, so first, Lily goes into Daniel's room around 10pm. She is locked in his room. Then we return home at 2 a.m. During that time, at around 1.30 a.m., we find that Lily texts her girlfriend, saying, Help me. You discover that neither Lily nor Daniel are home yet. Daniel's door is unlocked, and his laptop is still left on. You find the image, and then you leave. You return to your home, and heard Daniel had come home, but not Lily. Lily is still not back home, but Daniel is. What the hell could this all mean? I thought over it for a while and then came to a conclusion. I didn't want to make that connection, but it's the only connection I could salvage. Daniel did something to Lily, and we have to confront Daniel tonight. If Lily doesn't come home between now and tonight, we have to. Josh looked shocked, but he agreed. Daniel would be our only chance of finding out what happened to Lily. After that night, there were still no signs of Lily. We knew that her girlfriend would be calling soon, so we decided to turn the phone off. We didn't want to reassure her with false information. We waited until around 6 p.m. before Daniel finally came home. He looked rather startled to see us both standing there in the living room, and he lightly placed his art folder and satchel against the sofa. We both stood up. Josh spoke to him, and I could tell he was trying to keep his composure. Daniel, we'd like to have a talk. It's about Lily. Daniel's eyes seemed to widen ever so slightly, but nothing I thought was worth thinking over. He tilted his head at us, looking confused, and asked us, Why is something wrong? I shaken my head. I didn't want him to think we were accusing him of anything. We would never get any answers out of him if we straight up accused him like that. Daniel seemed to look a little on edge, looking away from us as he itched his wrists under his baggy gray jumper. He pushed his rather dark black bangs off his face as he spoke. Then what's wrong is... Is she okay? I mean, I know she left her phone here last night, so I suppose there wouldn't be any way of getting a hold of her. We didn't say anything. We weren't too sure on what to say to him. How are we supposed to ask him if he did anything to Lily without him taking offense? But then I realized something. It taken me a moment to realize it before I spoke. You just said she left her phone here last night, right? How the hell did you know that? I could see Josh's eyes light up. He realized the same thing I did. How on earth did Daniel know she had left her phone behind unless they went somewhere? 
He already acknowledged the fact that Lily never leaves her phone anywhere. So how on earth did he know that she'd left it behind? Daniel didn't answer us. He was silent for a while before he pushed past us and walked into his room, slamming the door shut. We walked over to his door, banging on it harshly before he shouted, Leave me alone! I have coursework to do! I'm sure Lily will show up tonight, just stop being so paranoid. <sighs> we just didn't know what to do. Daniel clearly knew way more than we let on. But there's no way we were going to get that out of him. We walked back into the living room and slumped back down. I ran a hand through my hair. <sighs> what is going on? I then realized that Daniel had left his bags on the sofa. He must have been too frustrated to pick them up when he stormed into his room. I peered around at Daniel's door, hearing no sound of him leaving his room yet. I knew soon enough he'd be coming out to get his bags. In a moment of madness, I picked up the satchel and emptied the contents onto the coffee table. I could see Josh's eyes widen before he whispered to me frantically, What are you doing? What if he sees you? I didn't care. I needed to know anything I could about Lily. She was a roommate, but also a best friend. I couldn't just leave this to solve itself. I pushed through documents and came across what looked like a ticket. I crumpled it up and pushed it into my pocket. Then I found a zip-up document bag. I pushed it into Josh's hands and told him to go hide it. He complied and went to hide it in his room. I then quickly put all the other stuff back into Daniel's bag and rested it up like it was before. Then I got up and walked into Josh's room. I watched Daniel go back to the living room to pick up his bags. Before he walked back in his room again, Josh grabbed the zip-up file and from under his pillow as we both sat down on his bed. He didn't say anything. We just read the front cover of the file. Teeth. It sent chills up my spine. I knew whatever was inside would have a connection to the image we found on the computer, but we saw nothing we expected. It was a series of photographs. The first photo was a picture of what looked like an abandoned room of sorts. The walls were covered in old floral wallpaper. The floor was just damp wood. It looked like it hadn't been used in years. Then the next photos were just pictures of tools and plastic tools. We then noticed that the tools were linked to dentistry. You know, like needles and drills. It was pretty creepy. But it was the next photos that made us both drain of color. It was photos of Lily smiling. We flipped through every single of Woodley, and each one, she had a big toothy smile. Such a sweet smile. One of her most distinct features was her large front tooth. Just our left one. We always found it cute, but it was no laughing matter. We noticed on the back of the photographs were labels, and each tooth and each photo was marked. There were notes on the photos that said things like, remove or replace. It knocked Josh sick, and I was more terrified than ever. We knew that we couldn't confront Daniel about these photos, that would get us nowhere. We just sat in silence for a long time, staring at the photos in disbelief. I then remembered the ticket I had found stuffed in my pocket. I reached into my pocket with a shaky hand and pulled it out, bringing it to my vision at read, Group Ticket 2, Location Station Road, Time Date, 2809-2011. 11.34 p.m. We both looked at each other. This was yesterday evening. We knew exactly what we had to do now. We had to find where Lily was. We never saw Daniel for the rest of the evening, and Josh had become incredibly paranoid. He asked if he could sleep in my room tonight. Now, although that was a bit awkward, I really didn't mind. I mean, he was scarred real bad, so I didn't want to leave him alone like that. When Josh was sleeping, I printed off a disturbing image for referencing when I spent most of my night planning the next day. I had already emailed our professors letting them know that we weren't going to show up because we felt sick, and I checked how far away the station road was. To my surprise, it was only an hour's drive away. So I figured we could take Josh's car up to the station road and figure out the location of where Daniel and Lily had been. The whole time, I kept staring at the teeth.jpg image. The horrible thought crept into my mind. I didn't want to think about it. But it could have been a possibility. What if the person in the picture 
It's Lily. Every time I thought about it, I'd shake it off, telling myself I was just paranoid, but it would all add up. The timing, the photographs, it would all make sense. I didn't want to believe it. I certainly wasn't going to, until we found Lily. The next morning, myself and Josh got up around 6am. We wanted to be at our dorm before Daniel woke up. We made sure to lock our own doors, so we decided to take Lily's phone with us. We didn't want to leave anything behind that would indicate that we were suspicious. We left the dorm and got into Josh's car. I had brought a long, small bag full of different things, such as the photographs, the flashlight, the camera, and a notepad with a pen. We loaded ourselves into the car and made our way towards Station Road. We were able to pinpoint it with a GPS. When we got there, we found that we were in a rather abandoned looking area of town. This place was practically deserted. All we could see was tall crumbling buildings and little empty houses. We'd taken out the photo of the room and began to walk up each little house. We pressed our faces to the glass to see if we could make out the floral wallpaper like in the photograph. We spent a good few hours just doing this alone and we found nothing. We were getting pretty angry at this point. We just wanted to get Lily back. Josh got so angry that he walked up to one of the house walls kicking it harshly as he shouted at the top of his lungs, Daniel, you sick bastard. Just as he kicked the wall one last time, we noticed that it began to tear like paper. Josh looked down at his foot and realized that he tore what looked like a piece of the painted wallpaper from the stone wall. He had began to rip away the remaining pieces of paper, only to reveal what looked like an outdoor basement. The doors were rustic and scratched, and we noticed a metallic handle was clean, as if it had been tampered with. Josh looked over his shoulder to me, and I gave him a nod. I quickly took a photo of the layout of the basement. Josh then walked down to the doors and gave them a push. And to both of our surprise, the doors were simply blocked by plank wood, which Josh was able to push away with ease. We then pushed and opened the doors slowly and cautiously. If only we knew what was coming. Perhaps it would have saved us both from throwing up. As we stepped inside, we were met with the rancid odor. Neither of us knew what the smell was, but we knew it both made us feel instantly sick. Josh gagged and coughed, covering his face with his shirt. I swallowed back vomit as I continued to walk. I pulled out my flashlight and shined it inside the pitch black stone room. I continued to walk, and we heard nothing. As we walked further into the room, the smell only thickened. It was getting so bad that Josh threw up behind me. He quickly composed himself and stumbled back upright before we continued. As I looked around the room, my eyes met with something on the floor that made my heart race and the flashlight drop from my grasp. It was Lily's knitted sweater. It was the sweater she always wore when she went out for pizza or went to go bowling. It was the same gray sweater with the same little torn threads on her sleeves. I could see Josh from the corner of my eye. His eyes were as wide as mine, as all the last color drained from his face. I picked up the sweater slowly, holding it in front of me when I noticed there was a large thick blood stain soaking all the way through the jumper. It started thick from the collar and became thinner as it went down the sweater. I was now the one to throw up. I collapsed on my knees, puking heavily. I didn't know what to do. I didn't even know what to think. I soon maintained myself and stood up again, holding up the flashlight. As I put up the sweater in my bag, through blurred, teary eyes, I pressed on. I found nothing from where I was standing, and I heard a small light switch flicker from behind me, as red light filled the corner of the room. And then I heard him. Josh screamed louder than ever, louder than anything I'd heard before. My stomach was in knots as I shined the light to wherever he was standing. I was standing over a large black table. I watched him stand there in complete terror, as if he was frozen. I can only imagine what he was looking at, and I truly wish I left it to my imagination. I walked over to the side, and I laid my eyes on the sight before me. It was Lily. She was strapped down on the table, wearing nothing but her jeans. Her body was covered in thick layers of tape, keeping her strapped down. 
One of her arms dangled to one of her sides, but the other arm was nowhere to be seen. In replacement was just a taped up stub with stains of blood under it. I could hardly breathe. My stomach was now knotted and my breathing was so tight, all I could do was stare. I looked up at Lily's face. Her head had been forced back. And we could see that her innocent blue eyes had been violently gouged out. And in replacement was a thick black wax that filled up the empty eye sockets. Her nose had been contorted and broken, snapped in many places. But the worst part of all was her mouth. Her jaw had been forced open. We could see her mouth had also been filled with the same black wax. Her teeth had been ripped out and misplaced in all different directions. I noticed how her mouth had been stretched upright, her cheek tearing to reveal more teeth. It gave her a contorted, horrible smile. Her face was covered in streams of her own dried blood. I stared at the hand that was holding the mouth open. It was her own. Her own hand had been stitched to rip her cheek. The flesh was torn, falling apart under her nails. Her nails were cracked and chipped. They were cracked and chipped with staples and little threads holding the hand in place. The red fluorescent light created a horrific shadows and highlighted every grotesque feature that was now on Lily's face. I silently and numbly I silently and numbly pulled out the picture of teeth.jpg and stared at it. And back to the real thing. They were identical. Josh brought a shaky hand over Lily's cheek before he collapsed on the side of the table. I could hear him sobbing horrendously by her side before he passed out beside me. I too felt like I was on the brink of collapsing, but something caught my attention. You see, I could feel the presence of someone else coming into the room, but I already knew who it was, and I knew there was nothing we could do about it. I heard the door slam shut, and the plank of wood being placed over the door. I heard the sound of footsteps, I heard them inch closer and closer, until I could feel their presence behind me. I knew he was there, and I knew there was no way out. I heard their voice speak faintly behind me. I'm so sorry you had to find out this way, but it's okay. It's all for the sake of art. But that wasn't what made me collapse. I knew well enough from here on out that my fate was sealed, but after he finished speaking, I heard one more tiny sound that made both my heart ache and my tears stream further down my cheeks. Before my vision faded away from me, and my hands slipped away from the table. I could hear Lily choking. 